In today's video, we're gonna talk about beauty habits that could be ruining your eyes. Now, as an interventional dry eye specialist and optometrist, the intersection of health and beauty is my passion, literally. I live it every day. I see patients in my clinic for routine eye exams, eye health problems as an optometrist, and I also have a spa in my clinic where we focus on eye safe beauty and skincare. So I promise that that connection between health and beauty is very deep, and right now there are several beauty habits that you might even have that could be negatively affecting your eye health. So today I'm gonna share with you some repetitive patterns that I've noticed in my patients that you could also be dealing with and how to bring those up with your eye doctor. And I'm also sharing today with some of my fellow eye care professionals what I'm noticing and what may work in your practice for your patients. Back to eye school with me, Dr. D, where I teach you about products and treatments related to dry eye syndrome and eye beauty so that you can have healthy, beautiful, comfortable eyes. And before we get started, make sure to give a little love tap on that subscribe button down below to stay up to date with all the latest eye tips and tricks I have for you. So have you ever wondered why the very first place you show signs of aging is around the eyes? I mean, I've definitely noticed these crow's feet and 11s are starting to show every day. And I know it's more than just me. Think about it. Where does everyone who gets Botox get it, right? 11s and crow's feet. Those are some of the first things that happen. It's so common that it permeates culture. Even men know the name crow's feet. And this is because the skin around the eyes is very, very thin, and it's among the most delicate on your whole body, which means it is the first area where you'll notice signs of aging. As I've said on this channel many times before, what goes around your eye ends up in your eyes. This is something validated by research. We know this as eye doctors. What our patients put around their eyes ends up in their tear film and in their eyes. And your eyes themselves are an orifice and they're highly vulnerable to the products that you're putting around them. In fact, the chemicals involved in certain makeup products and even beauty services can damage your eyes. And this is where there is that intersection of health and beauty. Yes, your eye doctor cares about lash extensions that you're using or lash serums that you're using. So let's talk about the main things that can harm your eyes, beauty things that can harm your eyes. So first we're gonna talk about lash growth serums because there's some things that you need to know here. All right, so let's first talk about the prescription options. So years ago, Bimatoprost or you know Lumigan was approved by the FDA for the treatment of glaucoma or ocular hypertension. This was back in 2001. So that was to be used as an intraocular pressure lowering agent. I have a whole video about IOP intraocular pressure here as it relates to glaucoma. So initially, bimatoprost was a glaucoma drop. And we noticed in the clinical trials that glaucoma and ocular hypertension patients that use this topical eye drop would experience this side effect of darker and thicker eyelash growth. Now what bimatoprost does and any other prostaglandin analogs, because that's what bimatoprost is, it's a prostaglandin analog, these target the antigen phase of the eyelash growth cycle, which results in longer, thicker eyelashes with more melanin deposition. Prostaglandin analogs can also increase the number of eyelashes in the lash follicle itself. And in 2008, this original glaucoma drop bimatoprost was relaunched as Latisse and many people have heard of Latisse made by Allergan. It is an FDA approved therapy for the treatment of hypotrichosis. It is commonly used to treat trichotillomania, which is when patients pull their eyelashes out themselves, chemotherapy induced eyelash loss. I've myself had patients after chemotherapy that really appreciate Latisse to help them grow lashes again and even alopecia. So you can have alopecia um, the hair on your scalp but also on your lashes as well and Latisse is successfully used for alopecia patients. In its first year on the market, Latisse pulled in $47.7 million, making it one of the most successful pharmaceutical launches ever. Due to the success of Latisse, the American beauty industry responded by rolling out its own versions of OTC eyelash growth serums like 
crazy. So what you may not know as a patient though, is that over-the-counter eyelash growth serums can contain synthetic prostaglandins with the same side effects as that prescription version. Unlike pharmaceutical companies, cosmetic companies are not required to list the potential side effects of a prostaglandin analog or any ingredient on their packaging. And there are some known side effects of prostaglandin analogs like you're going to find in both Latisse and some of the over-the-counter lash growth serums. So these can include conjunctival hyperemia, which is just when your white part of your eye gets red. You can have skin or iris pigmentation changes. So those blue eyed people that love their blue eyes, you can have a darkening of that iris pigmentation. You can also have allergy type effects like itching and swelling. You can have lash loss or falling out and your eye pressure may go down as well, which we don't normally see as a problem. But if you are being treated for glaucoma as well, that is definitely something your doctor is going to want to know. So the big one though with prostaglandin analogs is that they've also been identified as a potential causative factor from, for my bony and gland dysfunction and varying degrees of thinning of the eyelid margins and even acquired blepharophimosis. So that's a decrease in the, in the aperture between your eyelids. So they can, long story short, make your eyelids droop a little bit. There is no known percentage or concentration of prostaglandin analog that we would consider side effect free. So just to comment on this a little bit more, for me as a dry eye specialist, and I think many of you that follow this channel, dry eye is definitely top of our minds. And so using a prostaglandin containing eyelash growth serum, it's very problematic for me because the risk of meibomian gland atrophy or meibomian gland expression changes is very, very high. And in fact, in my dry eye clinic, I have a number of patients who are prostaglandin analog users or maximum medical therapy glaucoma patients who have had to be on prostaglandin for many, many years, and it has caused major issues with their meibomian glands that we have had to work on with IPL and other therapies. And so if you are a dry eye patient watching this, I would say the biggest thing to avoid in over-the-counter lash growth serums would be prostaglandins. And when you look at the patients who use over-the-counter lash growth serums, over 40% of people who try these types of things end up dropping out. And usually 43% of the time, it's because of side effects. Now it doesn't say which side effects, but we know that that's a significant reason for for stopping. And so that's why it's so important that you share with your eye doctor if you are using a lash growth serum. It could be affecting how your contact lenses feel. It could be affecting your dry eyes, giving you that burning or gritty sensation. And it's definitely something I would advise disclosing with your eye doctor. The second thing you might be doing wrong, um, potentially in terms of your eye beauty that could be affecting your eye health is that there is a wrong way to remove eye makeup. So first of all, number one, it's important to keep your eyes healthy and clean by removing all your eye makeup at night. This is like makeup rule numero uno. If you do anything, take that makeup off, especially around your eyes. But keep in mind that the products you're using to take off your makeup are just as important as taking it off in the first place. So unfortunately, if you don't use your products correctly to remove your makeup, then you're only going to maneuver any bacteria back into your eye and potentially increase your risk of redness, irritation, and even an infection. So first of all, don't rub too hard when you're removing makeup. That eyelid skin is the thinnest in the body and rubbing can cause stretching and worsen fine lines and wrinkles. Never go back and forth. So use a soaked cotton pad, one for each side, and gently wipe that skin and eyelashes starting from the inner corner and move outward in one direction only. I like you to gently wipe the edge of the eyelid and the lashes moving from the inner corner out and go top to bottom. You don't wanna use a regular facial cleaner or an eye cream or lotion to clean the eyelids either because many facial cleansers have harsh ingredients that can irritate or dry out that eyelid skin. Oil-based products and those harsh chemicals can also clog the tiny oil glands in our eyelids and cause irritation and dry eyes. There is no perfect product for removing eye makeup. You know, we've talked about this. I've seen it in the comments about, can I use my cellar water? And then even looking at my cellar water, some of the versions of that have preservatives and things that are, we don't know if they're eye safe or not. So this is such a difficult question to answer which eye makeup remover is the very best. I would say that I, I tend to like cream cleansers over a straight 
like oil formulation or a gel formulation. In my clinic, we use a brand called Illumier, and I really like that a lot. It's a medical doctor or eye doctor type of thing. You can only get it in doctor's offices, and it's a brand that's dedicated to clean beauty, but there's no perfect one. And I, I know that question comes up a lot. It's very individualized. So it is definitely something I would bring up with your eye care provider, especially if you do have irritation with your current makeup remover. So I would say remove your eye makeup first and then wash your face. And then that's gonna help remove any residual residue left behind on your cheeks from your eye makeup. And don't forget your eyebrows as well. In terms of eye makeup remover, we definitely wanna avoid any that would contain alcohol because that can irritate and dry the that skin around your eyes. That eye skin around your eyes is so delicate in the periocular area. We also wanna swap waterproof mascara for maybe a tubing version. At all costs, avoid waterproof. I know it stays on better. I know it doesn't transfer, but it requires so much more energy to get off. It has dimethicone in it. I made a whole video about waterproof mascara. So I wanna see you avoiding that. I actually like some of the tubing versions because it's made up of a formula of polymers that wrap around each end individual lash and it tends to be a lot easier to remove. Rather than painting layers of pigment onto your lashes, you're coating each individual lash with a tube that seems to not budge and transfer as much and is also easier to remove at night. Third, I want you to start maintaining a schedule for replacing your makeup and not just your mascara. All cosmetics have a shelf life and you can actually see that shelf life. You may not realize it, but on the back of cosmetics, they'll have a little miniature version. It looks like a little graphic of the product and it'll have like a 3M or 6M and that means you should change it every three months or six months. But once you open your cosmetics and they're in use, the clock is ticking much faster. They're gonna have a shelf life anyway, but once you start using them, now you're applying it to your skin. We know that bacteria lives on our skin. You're going back and forth to that makeup. So it's really important to pay close attention to the products you use around your eyes. Replace your mascara, eyeliners, and eyeshadows at least every three months. And if you get an eye infection, I still maintain that you should throw it all away. Now you can look at disinfection strategies and I know in my comments people say like, I'm not throwing this expensive stuff away, but if you've had EKC, epidemic keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, or you've had a major eye issue, then we need to just start new because we don't wanna be reinfecting ourselves. A few other tips on this topic. So don't under any circumstances share eye makeup products with anyone ever. You know, the big stores, I love a big makeup store as anybody does, but be very cautious because you just don't know if people are, you know, applying and trying out the testers and putting it back in. Those are no-go zones for me. Avoid those product testers at the beauty counter. Even if they offer a single-use applicator, you just don't know what anyone's done with it. Test the product on the inside of your arm if you feel you must. Don't let anything but sealed, new, fresh products get anywhere near your eye. If you must, use a sterile solution instead of water to mix with shadows. I would definitely recommend that. Okay, so let's talk about some things you might want to avoid around your eyes. Now, this is a, a, a topic fraught with many opinions, and nobody knows the consensus on that yet. In fact, the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society has an entire task force around skincare and beauty products in the eye. I recently did a survey for them about talking to my patients about these things. And we don't have their consensus yet. I know there's other ophthalmologists and optometrists publishing papers all the time about, you know, what makeup and preservatives can be used around the eyes. And so know that this is an emerging topic, but also know that most cosmetic manufacturers are using some form of preservative in their product to keep it fresh and shelf stable for as long as possible. You have to have a preservative. You know, if you don't have a preservative, preservative, you can grow some pretty nasty bugs. And so preservatives are a necessary evil, but it really becomes the dose makes the poison. What can we use around the eyes? What can we not? And in what concentration? And unfortunately, we just don't 100% know the answers to that yet. Unfortunately, some of the preservatives used can pose a risk to the eye and the tissue around it. So just take time to read that ingredient list of any product you plan to buy. Try to avoid things like formaldehydes, parabens, and BAK, benzylconium chloride, 
is known to be toxic to the cells of the surface of the eye, which is particularly risky if you have dry eye and if you're a contact lens wearer. It also goes by several names. So quat-15, quaternium-15, guar hydroxypropyl trimonium chloride. I mean, these names get so long, but look for those. I'll put them on the screen so you can see them. And finally, say no to trends. You know, we see like TikTok white eyeliner in the waterline. Waterline eyeliner is always a no-go for me no matter what color it is no matter how safe the eyeliner is because your precious meibomian glands are on that water line another one you know trendy thing halloween contacts i made a whole video about that glitter made a whole video about that glitter can have if it's craft glitter it can have metal pieces it can be made of glass so we don't want to have you using that if you wear contact lenses using makeup adds a layer of complexity to that process of wearing contact lenses and a little bit of an element of risk to eye health, right? The more we have going in and around the eye, the more we're touching the eye, the more of a problem. So minimize the risk of irritating and infecting your eyes when wearing contacts and makeup by making sure that your hands are thoroughly clean and dry before you start. Dry hands ensure that tap water, which is not that sterile, and may in fact contain bacteria that could wind up in and around your eyes is not on your hands. We want your hands dry. So I always put my contacts in before putting my makeup on actually. And the reason I do that is because I know what's around my eye can end up in my eye. So if I'm using powder or anything that could kind of drop in my eye, I don't want that getting trapped underneath my contact and having the risk of scratching or otherwise irritating my eye. So personally, I put in my contacts first and then put my makeup on after. You can also remove your contacts contacts first before taking off your makeup. That way you don't end up with makeup kind of all in your tear film and getting under the contact lens and messing up your contacts. Contacts are like sponges. And so if you are, especially if you're wearing monthly lenses, kind of getting those lenses out first before we start moving that makeup around is a good thing. If your eye does become irritated from the cleansers you're using or the process of removing it, don't compound the problem by putting a contact on top of it. Always, 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 if your eye is red, don't put your contacts in or leave them out for a little while while your eye calms down. Just wear your glasses for a little bit, which you should always have backup glasses, and if necessary, contact your eye doctor for advice. So definitely let me know about your experiences and questions about your beauty routine. There's so much when it comes to the beauty routine that could be hurting your eyes. You know, we didn't even get into lash extensions or anything like that, although I've made videos about that before. These are just some of the day-to-day -day things, like, you know, getting out your makeup, avoiding those lash serums, especially with prostaglandins in them. But let me know about your beauty routine and questions you have about things that could be contributing to your dry eye or hurting your eyes. So leave those comments below. That is going to be it for today's lesson. Class is dismissed and I'll see you next time.